Yes. Um, yeah, Rab Sprague, the Chief Medical Officer of the Health System. Mm -hmm. You indicated that in your count of primary care providers, you didn't include nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. and yet one of your action steps is to broaden scope and access to nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we have a number of mid-level providers, mm -hmm. nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and yet our ratio of population to primary care providers has really knocked our health ranking, our uh, medical mm -hmm. care ranking, down to 13 from 3 uh, a year or two ago. So uh, if we engage in that action step, it's not going to show up in our ranking. So no. is, there, are, is there any effort to try to include, be more inclusive in counting primary care providers? Yeah. In that? Think th that's a great question and a great issue. <laughs> um, that is true. Um, we're talking about having conversations with HRSA. The data file comes from HRSA. And so we are working, and when I say we, I mean our project leadership and our colleagues at the foundation. Uh, uh, you know, a whole other thread of this is looking at our national federal a a entities and talking about how these data are created and collected. Um, and so I know we are in the process of talking with Mary Wakefield and others at HRSA about that. It would be really helpful if there was a way we could add those because I, you are absolutely right. And that is dinging many, many communities um, in terms of what their true primary care provider rate is. Now, the other thing I would say about that is sometimes you just need to ignore the rankings. <laughs> I know they don't pay me to say that. <laughs> But seriously, I, I think there are times, I mean, we're very honest about what the limitations are in terms of these rankings. I've been very frank with you. And so, I mean, the sim similar thing about recreational opportunities. You get your trail connected here, and you're not going to improve in the rankings on access to recreational opportunities either. So I think it's really important to also be able to tell your story with measures from your own community that describe that. So you could, you probably have the resources here to recalculate that primary care provider rate based on local data in a way that better reflects what's happening in your community. And we encourage you to do that. Now we've also had people say, well then will you take our data and put it in the rankings? <laughs> um, and I will tell you, the data people will say no. <laughs> because they, I mean, part of it is pragmatic. If we all of a sudden started collecting data from 3,141 counties, I, we don't really have an army of data people there. This whole thing, the data part of this project is put together by uh, less than half a dozen people. So we don't have the resource to do that. But we do have a place on the rankings website where you can report additional measures. And we have had um, states come forward and say, we'd really rather, or we'd like to also report, for example, our behavioral risk factor surveillance survey we did at the state level that has a larger sample size and more accurate data. So we do have a mechanism for also reporting other data on the website. It won't be used for the rankings calculation. But, yeah. Is there any data, when I went to school, there was a school nurse in every single school. Mm -hmm. And now school nurses are obsolete in many yeah. in communities. Mm -hmm. And we don't have very many in the county. Mm -hmm. The clinic, I think, is a good direction, but not every school can do right. the clinic. Is there any data, research out there showing um, any impact in the schools? Because that was your that was your resource to go for health questions. Right. And with your support, your advocate. Mm -hmm. Any data that shows um, the impact of removing school nurses from, from the I don't know of any that I can tell you off the top of my head. No. Are there any indications in any of this that supporting returning mm -hmm. school nurses or some type of health individual into the schools? That is there, might be through, and when the right. schools are open. Right. I don't know. It's kind of the same question as the impact of the school health clinics. Um, I'll have to go back and talk with our evidence analysis folks to see. I mean, they very well have looked at that when they've looked at the whole issue of access to care um, as part of the, the literature review there. I apologize. I just don't know if, A, they looked at it, 
and what it showed, or B, they looked for it and didn't find anything, or C, they didn't look specifically for school nurses. So um, those, but I can certainly go back and look at that and forward information back to you. School health clinics and the impact of school nurses will get further information. I'm gonna, back here. I'm Rick Klein, Grand Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, first, thanks for telling me that part way through. Oh, stuff, the, because I had a blast. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna ask a question. Do you address, you know, do you directly address community readiness for change on your website? I did tool around a little bit, but yeah. That's a great question. I don't know that we have a specific community readiness for change tool. We talk about a lot of things in the work together tools and resources that are about talking with people in your community about getting um, prepared for change. But I don't know that we have a specific readiness for change tool. If you know of one, we'd love to talk with you about that because I think that's a really, important point. Um, I think it's an, another really important point is this does not happen overnight. <laughs> um, and part of readiness is, first of all, raising awareness. And then part of readiness is bringing the right people to the table. And then part of readiness is realizing where your gaps and needs are. And then part of readiness is really looking at what do we already have in place and what else do we need to do. So in that general theme there are a number of places we've got tools for that but I'm aware for example when we did tobacco control work in my community we had a community readiness tool that helped us see whether we were ready for policy change and I think um, if there are not tools on there for especially readiness for policy change we should be sure and, and get them in our and that would that piece would be in the act session section of the Roadmaps Guidance Center. Yeah. Um, do you have a list, or or have you compiled a list based on um, some historical perspectives of the most effective uh, solutions to going from number sixty-seven to number seventeen? Or uh, uh -huh. so do you have? Have you found that across America there are certain things that communities can do that might really make an impact on raising mm -hmm. uh, the health of the county? Mm -hmm. We do not have the package. <laughs> um, I really think that is what we're striving to do with the What Works database. I mean, if you go to those things with stronger evidence, you're more likely to have more impact. What, but what is missing? is actually getting back to your question over here, is how do we look at where there's the strongest evidence and the areas of focus that have the most impact and combine that together? And that is something we are talking about, looking at. One of the things I didn't show you on the website, um, I can direct you to, there's a first start in this, is on your snapshot, You'll see that little button there. I don't know if this has a, right here. Areas to explore, right above the air margin. And that is based on the weighting, based on comparisons to state and national data. If you click on that areas to explore, it highlights for you some of the areas that would have the most impact if you focused on those areas in your community. So that starts to give you, we started to do an algorithm of where you can have the most impact. And you click on that and it highlights them in orange. And then, as we have the database, you could go in that area then to look at areas, because the database is linked by each of these areas in the health factors. And you could go to the database and look at where the most effective policies and programs are. So yeah. your thinking is right on target, and we're trying to put the tools in place. The other thing about measuring who's had the most rapid improvement, it, we are talking a lot about how to measure improvement as part of the rankings. Because here's the difficulty with rankings. I love 1 in 21. I love aspiring to be the healthiest community in your state. And that will motivate you to keep moving forward. 
The challenge though is if every other county in Michigan is motivated to move forward and everybody improves at the same rate, you will get a lot better, but your ranking won't improve. And so we are really struggling with this, that part of the story needs to be improvement as well as gross ranking. The difficulty with that is it's very hard to measure improvement and, and be, have reliable and valid statistics. We actually have been doing some analysis of trying to do it at a state level where you have you know, much larger numbers. And so we're very cautious about using some kind of improvement number that doesn't tell the real story. And so that's why I go back to the answer I gave over here about we, we're one little piece of looking at what's happening in your community and how things are moving forward. And so we have, we would absolutely support you. If next year the rankings come out and Muskegon hasn't moved or you've moved down, um, to, to be able to tell your story, yep, that's what that one report shows, but let me show you where we've moved and what we know in our own community. Let me show you how we're using mid-level providers to improve primary care. Let me show you how we've improved our trail system so this recreational opportunity number isn't all it looks like it should be. And let me show you what's happening in this community. So um, it's really important that we not just rely on the rankings for the measure of continuous quality improvement in your community, but that you use both interim measures and your own stories to tell about how you're moving forward. So, time for a few more questions, if there are? Okay, back. Jill promised you I'd ask you a question. <laughs> oh. um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the indicators. I know that they've mm -hmm. changed over time. Right. Anything you're anticipating for the next release? Okay. Any changes? Great. Well, let me tell you a little bit about where we change and where we don't. So we have made a commitment not to change the indicators in the health outcomes. So the green bars, those measures of long-term health in your community, we are not going to change those. And the reason we're not going to change those is we want people to be able to have this long-term measure over time that's longitudinal and looking at the same measures. So. Those are going to stay the same, and assuming the county health rankings are still here 10 years from now, which I think they will be, you can look at where you were in 2010 and where you are in 2021, <laughs> and you'll be able to see, based on the health outcomes, how you changed relative to other communities in Michigan. In the health factors, we promise you we will change things, however. So comparing your health factor rankings over time really probably not a very valid comparison over a longitudinal factor. And the reason for that is for the very reason, you know, I discussed the change we made from college graduation to some college. As we look at these indicators, number one, we're learning more about what's modifiable and what the effects and the relationships are between different elements. We are always gathering feedback about the relative weights and new measures that could be added. Um, we are learning, uh, we are finding new data sources that, I mean, someday there may be a county level immunization rate and we would probably include that if, if we had that. So we are always looking for better data, better feedback, and better data on modifiable areas um, to an, impact that area. We are. I, I, you know, we're still kind of, we're just getting over the release of the last rankings. <laughs> um, you know, our data people work like 24-7 the first quarter of the year, and, um, and then they take a breath the second quarter of the year. Um, but they are getting ready to start on thinking about um, factors for next year or measures for next year. I don't know exactly where we're looking at. I know we, w we would love to improve that recreational opportunity. I know they are actively searching for something that's updated regularly about green space or walkability or something that is better reflective of the natural environment to support physical activity. <clears throat> I also know we continue to search for a water measure 
we know the physical environment is one of our weaker areas. And then we're also continuously looking at new questions that have been added to the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey and seeing if there's anything in there that would be helpful to add. Um, we've also had some discussion about uh, adding other measures related to perinatal health. There have been some issues with fairly recent, I mean within the last decade, changes in the birth certificates that have precluded that in the past, but we might be getting past the time of that change where we could look at some other measures there. Um, and I would say if you have suggestions, if there are measures missing or concerns about measures um, in addition to what's been discussed here today, uh, please feel free to send me a note and I will pass it along to our data team as they look at this. Leaders are called to stand in that lonely place between the no longer and the not yet and intentionally make decisions that will bind, forge, move, and create history. We are not called to be popular. We are not called to be safe. We are not called to follow. We are the ones called to take risks. We are the ones called to change attitudes and to risk displeasures. We are the ones called to gamble our lives for a better world. Now I'm gonna send you out here and say go gamble because yeah, that's, a, that's a poor health behavior, but I am going to tell you to go out and please gamble your life for a better world and for a better Muskegon County for all that we envision in the 121 group, the health project, all of us who've worked together for so many years. Let's go on, I'll take your lessons of today and have a wonderful day. Thank you.